Hi. This is going to be a presentation on Patrick Lecture 116, which is Reaching the Spiritual Center, and also a struggle between superimposed conscience and the lower self. And there will be a workshop this month. So I'm preparing this set of slides and this presentation uh, so that during the workshop, we'll only be doing exercises and experiential work. And I won't have to be teaching and going over the concepts. So it's a review of the lecture, but it's also integrating the tool of meditation for three voices which is based on Patrick Lecture 182, The Process of Meditation. Uh, meditation for Three Voices is a wonderful technique. It'll be explained in the slide presentation. Uh, I've been using it for several lectures. Uh, the first was decision-making, which involved the ego and the real self. And then this adds the superimposed conscience and an element of lower self. And then next month, I'll be introducing a few more negative voices, which are difficult to work with unless you have a clear concept of ego and real self and a little confidence in working with voices that aren't completely positive. Uh, so let me get this started. So oh, this is Reaching the Spiritual Center, uh, Struggle Between Lower Self and Superimposed Conscience, Patrick Lecture 116. Uh, this is a list of what I'm going to cover, an awareness and understanding of spiritual matters and how they can bring a sense of security, two fundamental attitudes towards life, how to distinguish voices such as the ego and real self, uh, the general idea of Meditation for Three Voices, Patrick Lecture 182. Uh, then a section on exploring the superimposed conscience as a third voice, and then introducing the lower self and how it can influence the superimposed con uh, conscience. So awareness and understanding of spiritual matters can bring a sense of security. These sentences are long and uh, sometimes you, you have so many words that you, you don't look at the individual ones. So what I like to do is I like to define terms. Now, sometimes these terms are jargon to some extent and they're explained, they're shorthand for pathwork concepts. But this sentence is not pathwork. This is, uh, but it's still very complicated. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to go through defining spiritual matters. Now, spiritual can seem very, ooh, very special and very, uh, we, we have all kinds of ways of defining it. I went to the dictionary uh, and I looked at dictionary definitions for spirit. And it said a force or principle believed to animate living beings, the soul. Spiritual matters are not temporal matters. They are matters that involve whatever you want to call the difference between a dead human being and a live human being. It is that force or principle. Uh, the definition goes on to say that the belief is that this spirit endures after departing the body. So the spiritual matters are eternal. They are beyond lifetime matters. It's also associated with the part of a human being associated with mind, will, and feelings. What animates us, again, uh, or a pervasive or essential attitude, meaning an attitude, quality, or principle can have a spirit embedded in it. And then the actual or unstated sense or significance of something. In other words, there's a spirit within an idea. And I also liked the etymology don't like to be semantical about spiritual matters, but it helps. If you look at the etymology, it comes basically from the Latin and it goes back to the concept of to breathe. So when we breathe, we are alive. And when we are alive, 
something other than just mechanical action is happening. So then after defining spiritual matters, let's look at awareness. So awareness and understanding of spiritual matters. For that, I went to Patrick Lecture 127, Four Stages of Spiritual Evolution. I use this all the time. And I hold up four fingers and I just march through them. So you have the first stage is blind automatism. Now, blind automatism is something you aren't aware of. If you're not aware of it, you can't work on it. But it is also the result of being unwilling to face material. So it's blind automatism, but there's a reason for it. You, you don't want to deal with it. So you keep it out of your consciousness. Now, here's how I like to explain out of consciousness. I know this is silly, but I like practical examples. I ride a bike to and from subway stops and to and from places in the city. And uh, I always wear a helmet. That's my rule. Uh, there are reasons for my rule. It's a serious value that I have, a commitment I have made to family and my safety uh, to wear a helmet at all times. And yet, inevitably, every couple of weeks, I'll get on the bike and start riding, and I don't put on my helmet, especially in the winter when I've already got a hat on or a, a coat up. My rule is this. I can't do anything about the fact that I forgot because it's not in my consciousness. But at some point when I'm cycling along, I realize I'm not wearing a helmet. And my rule is at that moment, I become responsible for obeying the value system that I have signed up for. So at the moment where I realize I'm not wearing a helmet, I have little voices in me that say, oh, it's not that important. You're almost home. If you rode this far, all the voices that say, oh, never mind. And I have consistently been able to overrule them and say, uh, this is my promise. This is my value. This is a decision that I have made. The minute I am aware, I will stop and put on my helmet. Now, I know that sounds like a trivial matter. What I'm trying to explain is there's nothing you can do if you can't bring it into consciousness yet. The fact that you're unwilling to see something, that's just the reason it's out of your consciousness. It's still out of your consciousness. So you can't work with blind automatism. You have to wait until it descends into awareness. Now, awareness is traditionally the longest and most painful stage. It's incremental, it cycles back and forth with understanding. It's painful because you may have a lot of awareness. You may, you may realize a lot of things that you haven't been doing. Awareness of your dishonesty, awareness of a lack of integrity, awareness of prejudice, awareness of lower self-cruelty. This can just come upon you and it can feel overwhelming. And you're going to have to just breathe through it because you can't fix it all in that moment. And the desire to do too many things brings on a numbness. So there needs to be some level of maturity and willing to accept that awareness is painful. Why is it the longest stage? Because it goes back and forth with understanding. Now, understanding is a gradual accumulation of information about why the automatism existed, what it was trying to hide or protect, what the false beliefs and images were based upon. Now, if I go back to my helmet, there is probably something in that that's a, a resistance or a don't bother me or I don't really care and I'm not sure I want to believe in that. I'm sure there's something in there. It's not very big because I don't do it very often. And the minute I become aware, I stop and put on the helmet. So I accept that there's some negativity there. It's just not big enough to worry about. Now, if it happened more often, I would need to prioritize that. I would need to figure out what that's about. So a lot of automatism exists in your life. When you come into awareness, you can deal with it. 
If you keep dropping into awareness and dropping out, take a look at that and see if you can find what's going on. And that's part of your understanding. And that will help you bring the awareness in, it cycles back and forth until it drops into knowing. Knowing happens through personal experience. You don't have to touch it or do it. Personal experience can also be conscious awareness that is connecting to an understanding so that you see all the pieces and you get the dynamic. You understand the truth of a situation. That's when you drop into knowing. There's no more questions. You know. You may forget, but you don't have to spend a lot of time in awareness and understanding. You forget, you remember immediately. That's why I like to think of what happens when I forget my helmet. Now, we've got awareness and understanding. We've got spiritual matters can bring a sense of security. Let's define security. The aim of spiritual studies is to bring you into contact with your spiritual center, coming back to the lecture. This innermost core contains the treasure of divine love, wisdom, and strength. I didn't bother to quote every, most of this is from the lecture. I picked up phrases. Uh, so I did not write all this. Please give credit to the lecture. Innermost core contains the treasure of divine love, wisdom, and strength. It lies embedded in all of us. Nobody has more spiritual center than anyone else. The pathwork process encourages finding, understanding, and resolving hidden conflicts and distortions that block or obstruct contact with the spiritual center. That's what pathwork offers to help with. So if this aim is clearly defined, there's just not going to be a conflict. You're not going to be choosing whether I want spiritual interests or worldly interests. They're, they're going to come together because they're going to be based on truth. And that's what makes you feel secure. I'm in truth and I still need to get up in the morning. I may still need to work for a living. I may still need to interact with people that aren't pleasant to deal with, but I will also find more and more people who are pleasant to deal with because I know that I want, you, you know what this spiritual center is and you have found it a few times and you know when you find it again. And that is your security in life. That's the sense of security that this work brings. Um, the guide suggests that we take a personal inventory. I'm very fond of 12-step programs. That's why my, my concept is called Pathwork Steps. Uh, so step four is the one in 12-step programs. And it's making a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves to look at where we have gone astray from morals that we put forward that we believe in. Now, this lecture is actually about what those morals are and who put those forward, whether they're really ours or whether they were superimposed upon us. But the idea is that we're not looking at how much money I have, what my assets are, what my skills are. This is about a moral inventory. Where am I in terms of my integrity? Uh, Patrick lectures on taking a personal inventory. Uh, there are three of them I'm listed. And the ones that have uh, hyperlinks in the PDF that you can download are ones that I've already done study guides on. Uh, so these are useful uh, ways of doing different kinds of personal inventories. Um, and the next is to gauge your progress as well as what remains to be done by asking yourself to some degree. You now understand your problems. Do you still feel resistant to change despite your understanding? Do you still feel confused and in the dark? Do you feel unfree and obstructed? Or do you feel defensive and anxious? And then to ask yourself, am I hiding the effects or distracting myself to keep from gaining awareness of them? Now, this is different from automatism. Automatism is, I don't know what's going on. I, I, can't, I can't access it. This is where you're deliberately turning your head away so that you don't get the full impact of the awareness, but you know it's over there. And this is where 
there's a phrase, this work requires scrupulous honesty. You're gonna have to be honest, at least with yourself before you can really be honest with other people. Uh, so now we're down to two fundamental attitudes. First attitude is a search for God. The first thing I do is apologize for the word God because a lot of people have been wounded by religion. They are sensitive to how God is being presented to them. Once again, superimposed conscience, which we're getting to. Uh, so a search for God sounds like religious work. Uh, substitute the word that you choose. But if you're reading Pathwork lectures, if you're watching this video, you're looking for something. And you're looking for something spiritual because that's all I can offer. Uh, a search for God is a search for your divine center. So please be generous with the word God. The idea is that this is a fundamental attitude that a search for the spiritual divine center of you leads to the, to the spiritual center of you. Uh, it's a search for spiritual development rather than professional development or social development. The real self will be able to support and guide the ego. So it's a search for the real self, which is part of the spiritual center. A search for God is not a contradiction to a life of personal fulfillment. That is uh, talked about in the lecture at more length. Uh, it's a misunderstanding that a life of spiritual dedication, devotion to high values is going to prevent you from feeling personally fulfilled is not true. A search for God will bring interactions and decisions that will be based on spiritual truth. You'll feel better about them. They're founded on something real. Now, will that cost you in society where you may run into conflicts because not everybody wants to live in spiritual truth? But the question is, do you want to live in spiritual truth? And with this attitude of a search for God, higher power, or your divine center, then this spiritual aspect becomes a personal experience of spiritual reality rather than a theoretical experience. The second attitude talked about in this lecture is a desire for happiness and satisfaction. This is led by the ego. So one of the reasons I picked the lecture and one of the reasons I kept meditation for three voices as the tool for learning about it is that this again talks about the differences between the ego and the real self. Happiness and satisfaction are not spiritual goals in and of themselves. They are the effect of finding your spiritual center. So the effects are what the ego manages, that's its job. It's uh, happiness and satisfaction are based upon what the mind can understand. If the mind does not understand, it is not happy and it is not satisfied. Uh, happiness and satisfaction rely on external markers of success and achievement. So whether this search is led by your genuine uh, ability to be in your spiritual center and the ego is working on making that happen by, by ironing out the wrinkles and details, or whether the ego is leading this and only looking for happiness and satisfaction, it's still gonna rely on external markers of success and achievement. Do I have what makes me happy? Rather than I am happy, and I would like my environment to be supportive of that reality. Uh, a desire for happiness and satisfaction is not inherently a search for a spiritual center, although it can, it can work that way. But it's, perhaps it's a longer road. The results may be limited by life circumstances. So if you're living in a miserable situation, uh, you're gonna to have to change that miserable situation before you're going to find external happiness and satisfaction. But if you can find your spiritual center, then the external reality doesn't dictate your internal attitude. Uh, one of the things that is inherent in the lectures, although it's not highlighted very strongly, 
is that attitude is the only thing you really control. You don't control your ability to live, the meteor coming through the roof, uh, illness, whatever uh, decides that. Even though these matters are determined by spirit, I, I'm speaking of your conscious mind does not control uh, that spiritual path, that spiritual circumstances that are set in motion. So that life circumstances are going to dictate a lot of your happiness and satisfaction if that's what you're centered on. Uh, a desire for happiness and satisfaction can be based on a positive intention. It's not inherently evil. It just has consequences because of the direction it's pointing. It also can mask a desire to find easier goals and to avoid change and growth. It can be a deliberate attempt to lead away from the spiritual center. So this is just about two fundamental attitudes, two different approaches to life. And again, if you're reading a Pathwork lecture, you're probably in the search for God camp versus desire for happiness and satisfaction to some extent because the Pathwork does not uh, support and it does not um, come up with tools that make happiness and satisfaction easy to attain. This is self-analysis work and it's hard. It takes a while. Uh, so I'm gonna go to distinguishing voices such as the ego and real self. Um, the ego. Uh, ego is present whenever we're conscious. You're not without ego. Uh, and Patrick encourages the development of a strong and healthy ego. And this is from a lecture on uh, ego. I believe it's Patrick lecture, either uh, Patrick lecture 132 or 199. It encourages the ego to know its place, meaning that it understands as a larger spiritual reality and it's in partnership with that. But it is not the larger spiritual reality. That a strong and healthy ego chooses to accept life, including the disadvantages. It's not a demand that things be its way. That's an immature ego. It chooses to want to understand itself. In other words, it understands the concept that the more I understand, the better I will be able to relate and, and make sense of the world, the better I will be able to manage the world. It seeks to integrate itself with its own divine consciousness. And it strives to move out into real life as the real self. So I put this together and I, I use the word partnership. But that's how I see the, the interaction between the ego and the real self. But the ego functions are different from those of the real self. Now, a couple of these slides are going to be similar to those from the pre previous month, which was on Patrick Lecture 32, uh, Making Decisions, where I also used Meditation for Three Voices. The idea is that the ego has specific functions, and they're listed here. <clears throat> there are things that the ego can't do. Can't do not being an absolute, but it's not the function of the ego. Even the, the ego can, can taste it or, or have a little bit of fun with it. So for instance, to feel and produce deep feelings, these come out of the center of us. And the ego repeats, remembers, sorts out, selects, makes up the mind. So if I feel a lot of passion for something, the ego decides what to do about that. I'm inviting you to see these as two different functions, not because they're totally separate, but because it makes it easier if you understand where the emphasis is for both the real self and the ego. And then you can see how the dance can, can enact between the two of them. There's also some energetic indicators of the ego. Now, the list here on the ego side is somewhat negative because those are the ones we're focusing on. So rather than uh, list all the positive things that the ego does, I'm listing the things that the ego does that can get out of hand or have gotten out of hand. Pride, self-will, and fear are often talked about in the lectures. They are referred to in Patrick Lecture 30. 
uh, forcing currents. Uh, the best lecture on that is Patrick Lecture 77. Uh, and then there are several lectures about the I can't, I won't, uh, where the guide is, uh, guide, pardon me, where the ego is pretending that it can't do something because it doesn't want to do something. Uh, energetic indicators of the real self are, they're distinct. You can feel it. The real self has a deep inner knowing that everything is right with the universe, even though something may need to be done in the moment. That it's not because the universe is about to end or I'm bad and I'm about to be judged and I, there will be no hope after that. It's a deep inner knowing that everything is right with the universe. That's the spiritual center. May take a while to get there. A willingness to serve whatever is in the highest good for everyone. Whereas the ego tends to be ego-centric, ego-centered, egocentric. One of the ways you can tell the real self is it's not afraid. And sometimes that can be foreign. The idea of not being afraid is almost bizarre. If you've lived with a lot of anxiety, it just feels weird not to feel fear. But the real self doesn't feel fear. It's one of the ways we can sense or know that we're in a different place than the ego. Um, ability to flow with what is appropriate. And the questions would be not whether I can or can't, but are we able? Because sometimes we aren't able. Shall we choose to? It's an invitation. It's a looking at the situation and wondering whether we have the capacity and the forces and the interests to pursue something rather than I must, I should, I can, I can't. Um, I'm going to use three metaphors for the ego's relationship with energy. They're not perfect analogies or metaphors. They're, they're just different ways to look at it. And just like I'm using the spiral in this particular workshop, I've used symbols in other workshops. Uh, I used the scales in the lecture, uh, Patrick Lecture 32 on decision-making for the decision-making process. So one of the metaphors is ego as decision-maker. Uh, the positive is that the ego is willing to make decisions based upon spiritual truths even if the immediate consequences are uncomfortable or distressing. In other words, the ego is willing to trust, it's willing to work with, it's not demanding uh, a, a easy road, clean slate, happiness only. It's willing to work with spiritual truths and make decisions based upon them. The negative is when the ego makes judgments that reflect self-interest, hidden agendas, or it hides its own collusion with negative intentionality. Uh, second metaphor, ego as a vehicle that transports and delivers. I'd like to give credit to the teachers I had in my Patrick studies, who came up with these ideas and even the, they had their illustrations. I copied the, or I made my own illustrations, but the idea is theirs and I want to thank them. Uh, so ego is ego as a vehicle that transports and delivers. The positive is it's accepting its task of navigating the realities of life on the earth plane. That's its job. It's able to be inspired and led by the spiritual center. It can carry the real self and interact with it. The negative is it can also be driven by pride, self-will and fear or negative intention. So the idea is you've got this wonderful little car with a great beautiful package in the trunk. Uh, we encourage the pathwork encourages the development of a strong and healthy ego because unhealthy or weak ego is a manifestation of resistance to spiritual truth. It represents a no to the incarnatory task for a number of reasons that I don't want to go into in this lecture, uh, but there are lectures on that topic. An unhealthy or weak ego cannot perform its basic functions. And that's where it's, it's dicey as to whether that's true or convenient. 
because if you can't handle basic functions, you can't make decisions and you can't manifest uh, and you can't complete the incarnatory task, perhaps because you don't want to. Um, unhealthy or weak ego cannot withstand the influences of other energies, both inner and outer. It cannot carry the real self into life. The package of spiritual truth becomes a burden. Um, overdeveloped or overblown ego. Uh, they're just a different form of unhealthy ego. They want to take over the functions of the real self. I can do everything. It can easily be enlisted by other energies because it is not in reality. When it thinks it is making all the decisions, then it's not consulting with the real self. And since it's not in reality about what its functions are, it, it is easy to be deceived. So the idea is for a healthy ego to understand its limitations and functions, just like a person needs to understand their limitations and their capacities and their abilities in life to not overestimate or underestimate, but come as close as possible to some sense of reality, but who you are, what you can do, what you're willing to do. Healthy ego understands the importance of the package, the real self, and is able to partner with the real self in order to better understand and prioritize what it hears, sees, and feels. In other words, I see all these things, what does it mean? You have the answers inside you. You've got a spiritual center, a real self. It can assist you in understanding complex dynamics. So spiritual guidance is generated by and comes from the real self. It is enacted through the functions of the ego. Without the ego, the real self cannot enact its incarnatory task. I didn't go into definitions, but incarnatory task is a spiritual matter. And to do that, we have to live in matter. That, that's what we do on the earth. Uh, the guide hints that there are other schools, other places to learn things other than the earth. Uh, in science fiction, you, you think in terms of there are other organic life forms that aren't based on carbon or don't have matter. They are gassy. Uh, I can't speak to those. I just know about this planet. And on this planet, you work with a body and you need an ego. So awareness of this partnership is one of the many decision-making functions of the ego. The ego has to say Yes, for this partnership to be effective. Now, if the ego says no, that's part of the incarnatory task. It's not a mistake. It's just a reality. It says no. So I suppose the incarnatory task involves getting it to say yes at one point or to realize the ramifications of saying no. But the idea is that the ego is capable of making the decision to say, yes, I will be aware that that's one of its functions. Um, third metaphor, uh, ego acting as a channel of communication. So all I could come up with was a phone, a mobile phone and a keyboard. So the idea is the ego is a channel of communication and it needs to be willing sometimes to just translate the energy it senses directly into words without demanding to understand beforehand. This is very, very difficult. Uh, I have known some people with psychic abilities while they were in their, they were training towards that end. In other words, I knew them as they were struggling to figure out what all this input was and how to express it. And it's hard work. It's, it's, it's no, Diff no different than you're in, 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 let me see if I can get these words right. If you are going to be a ballerina, you've got to get there. You've got to go through practice sessions. You've got to develop the musculature. You've got to develop the muscle memory. You've got to develop strength. You need to practice, practice, practice. 
And in that time period, you're going to find areas that need more work than others. To reach in and feel the energy of the divine center, to translate your real self into words, you're going to need to be able to translate energy before you are sure that your words are sufficient. And so there's going to be a fairly long period of trial and error. One of my favorite examples of this is Ava Paracas's preface to a book she was going to write. The book uh, ultimately was called Path to the Real Self. Uh, it's featured as a complete tab on my website. And in her preface, she describes the process that she went through in learning to transmit the spiritual voice that we know as the guide. And uh, it still takes my breath away. Her description is that it took her five years, that she worked at it practically every day for five years. That's how long it took her to reaccess because she had a sense it was there and that it had shown up, but to recapture it, to train herself, to allow herself to be a channel for that voice took five years. So ego acting as a channel of communication to translate the energy it senses. Uh, that's the positive. The negative is to interpret or rewrite the energy it senses, hiding or distorting the meaning. Now, this can be conscious or unconscious. We may just believe the voices or the sensations are leading us someplace, and we don't realize how our hopes and dreams and expectations are prejudicing what we're hearing. So interpretation or rewriting versus translating, transmitting directly. So that's the third metaphor for the ego's relationship with real self and or energy. So now I wanna go into a short review on meditation for three chairs, uh, which comes from Patrick lecture 182, which defines a, a process for hearing different aspects of yourself. Now, let me pause here. Um, every time we uh, differentiate different energies, the idea is that I can, no long, I can no more differentiate the functions of my head as being a separate entity from the functions of my torso. I can't talk about the functions of my hand as if it was distinct from me because a cut off hand doesn't operate, cut off head, cut off torso. It doesn't operate. However, it can be very important to understand the different functions of these parts of us and therefore better understand the dynamics as responsibilities change back and forth, as different things come into play. Some things are, are coordinated in a way we don't fully understand sometimes. That's how I invite you to see these different aspects that, the, that we call voices. They are all you. They represent different aspects. And so we focus on those aspects to better understand them. And then eventually got to bring it back in and look at the integration and the reality of the connection of them. So meditation for three chairs is a process for differentiating between the voice of our inner divine knowing, the voice of the ego, so that we can then explore other aspects of the personality. In other words, you wanna be in contact with your real self. You need a transmitter, a channel of communication, that's the ego. So these two need to be there to work on the third voice. Props, such as chairs, clothing, or objects can be used to signal which voice we believe we are expressing. It is helpful to make this a little game-like to bring some lightness to it, to uh, have a candle when you're talk you believe you're talking from your divine self, to have a phone or a physical object that you use in your work when you're talking about your ego, and uh, something like a dollar bill when you're talking about what you think you need or the, this, this energy that you feel about finances or your place in the world. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it is useful to have either different seating positions, different chairs or different objects to help you get started 
after you get started with this, you won't need the props anymore. So it's just a beginning um, uh, support system. Uh, the practice is similar to voice dialogue, and I've given the um, website for that. They have videos and manuals, uh, and that can assist you in practicing. Uh, I learned uh, this technique in a group uh, with two other Pathwork uh, classmates, and we worked on it for a while. I think we spent eight or 10 hours working together. We watched voice dialogue videos, then we practiced um, until we had a sense of it. So meditation for three voices, step one. You want to explore the ego's willingness to serve versus participate. Uh, let me put it this way. If, if I want to serve, I say, well, what do you want me to do? So I can understand my function and my outline it so that I don't exceed my brief. I don't go beyond my function. If I want to participate, I want to participate. I want to contribute. I want to have some fun. Um, the ego is already invested at that point. And the ego is going to wind up being the subject of the meditation process because it's got to be cleared before you could consider a third voice. So you have to determine if the ego is willing to serve as a translator. If it's weak or frightened of the process, it may be unable to participate. It may need a facilitator to help do that or to do it in a group. If it's overdeveloped or overactive, it would interfere rather than serve. And in any case, the ego then becomes the client, a two voice process instead of three. Step two, uh, invite awareness of the real self. So what this does is it magnifies the ego's ability to recognize the real self. Since engaging in this process is already a joint venture. So another way of saying this is this. Um, every human being has a real self. Every human being has a divine center. The difference comes in in whether they can recognize it, whether they choose to access it, and whether they choose to listen to it. So we want to invite awareness of the real self, even though the real self was part of your reading the lecture, watching this video, getting involved with spiritual activities. So we wanna make this more conscious so that we have more awareness of it. So the ego has some conscious, um, I'm gonna call it touching point, a place to tap into to help it keep its functions clear. Uh, now the energy of the real self can feel like nothing because there's no fear, no self-will, there's no pride, no forcing current. It just feels empty. Um, so sometimes when I, when, I, when I chose the little symbol for these, these slides, I chose this very simplistic spiral that works. It reminds me of the search for the spiritual center. Uh, a, a picture of the Milky Way galaxy, it's, it's more complex, but it, it'll work. Um, the idea is to allow creativity, which as a reminder was on the slide, is a function of the real self. It's not that the ego can't have some ideas. I'm talking about the creative process starts in the spiritual center. So one of the places you can, one of the things you can do to access real self is focus on those functions or the activities um, or the energies and feel in you, where does that emanate from? And then uh, what you wanna be able to do is reference back to that. Uh, so this is uh, functions of the real self that you can reference. And this is energetic indicators of the real self. Uh, step three, uh, to explore two voice dialogue. So the idea is that you find two chairs, two seating positions or two objects. Uh, and then here's the tricky part. The ego will always do the actual speaking. The ego controls the tongue. The ego finds the thoughts and the sensations and gives them words. Where the ego is distorted, it will come up with a word that may not be fully appropriate. It may be the best it can do. Uh, as the 
ego gets better and more confident at this, it will be able to see that that's not the that's not the word I want. Let me see if I can pick. Let me see if I can say that differently. And you may have to practice phrasing what you're sensing. Okay. Uh, so the ego will always do the actual speaking. Um, if you're working with an observer or a facilitator, even another person, let them ask the questions and then you can just focus on the responses. Then you don't have to engage the ego into the process as much. Um, Patrick 116 says man has two kinds of consciences, one emanating from his real self and the other being a superimposed conscience, which we'll get to in a minute. But the idea is that uh, you have felt twinges of conscious, conscience. And what that is, is your real self going, I, I, I think that's a problem. I, I, I don't, and I'm, I'm doing the human voice version of, we should talk, um, I think there's a problem, uh, this goes against what we agreed on. It's a, however you, whatever words you use to express what happens when you get a twinge of conscience, that that is your real self. Uh, it's a sensory message. Uh, and this process, uh, one of the exercises you can do is go to your real self and ask what that was about. In other words, remember a time where it happened Ask your real self what they want. Use an experience you already know about that you may have had a number of times. Ask about something familiar to you to get the practice going, to talk to the real self and ask, what's going on? What were you saying? What, what was that about? Um, you can ask the ego how it's receiving the message. I know this is like, patting your head and rubbing your tummy, but it's actually easier than you think. You'll have to be careful with your questions. This is a little bit like writing a survey. So you've probably heard that poll takers and people who take surveys, they got to be careful about the questions they ask, because if you don't ask the right questions, you're going to skew your answers a certain way. So it takes some practice to even ask the right questions, questions that will center on what you need to know and not scoot off into other areas. And then you continue the conversation until it feels complete. Now, fourth step is if we expand into a three voice dialogue. Now, when you do that, what you're going to find is sometimes the ego is present in the dialogue and sometimes the real self is present. So you may go back and forth with the two. Um, uh, once again, you can change seating position. Um, and there may be at this point, other voices that come forward spontaneously. Uh, it's easier once you get used to the, to the two to add a third and then to swap around for the fourth, fifth and sixth. But the idea is you wanna find uh, a way for the, to know when the ego is speaking, uh, you wanna know where the real self is and then please feel free to give any other aspect of you a different name. Child consciousness, destructive child, uh, my three-year-old self, my 12-year-old self. Uh, you can hear voices and we'll get into superimposed conscience. You can hear voices that sound like your uh, fifth grade teacher or your maiden aunt or your mother or your father. And you can call these voices as that knowing that they are internal voices for you. Um, and you don't need props after a while. So the props are just to get you started. So now we're going to explore the superimposed conscience, which is a very large portion of this lecture. Uh, superimposed conscience is intended, it's deliberate, it's intended to prevent us from acting out our lower self instincts for our own good. Parents teach children what not to do before the kids understand why they're not supposed to do it. So it represents how we're coerced by outside forces to follow and obey their moral standards, societal customs, traditions, various forms of authority, 
before we are ready to diverge from that. So as you can well imagine, uh, you teach a kid to be good and the kid is good and then they hit their teenage years and suddenly they don't, they don't listen anymore. Well, that's natural and it's necessary because they're going to be transitioning into adults and they're going to be rewriting their version of the superimposed conscience, hopefully. So why would we focus on this? First of all, everybody's got them, if not one, several. Secondly, um, the superimposed conscience needs to supplant and repress our undeveloped or underdeveloped real conscience. And so we need at some point to awaken the real conscience. Even if once awakened, we agree completely with what we've been taught. The idea is that we can't just take what we're given. We can't just do it by rote. The doing it by rote is an ego process. And the real conscience is a real self process. So at some point, the real self needs to awaken and take leadership. And it's a gradual process. And as we do that, we break things, we, we do things wrong, we act out, we go too far, we don't go too far. It's a process. Uh, there's a spirit, there's a, a standard uh, human adolescence period. There's also a spiritual adolescence period. I like to think of the spiritual adolescent period uh, as happening later in life because we're going deeper. We're finding a, a deeper connection, different discrepancies between what we want and the world wants. And we're having to basically redo adolescence on a different level. Um, so that we need to learn about the superimposed, con superimposed conscience so that we can not eliminate it per se, but learn to become aware of it and understand it. And then we can start the process of educating and personalizing the superimposed post conscience so that it serves us rather than serving our parents, our village, our society. Um, so a superimposed conscience, if it's there all the time, it's going to induce us to reject our real self. Uh, as children, we just don't understand that our parents' need for efficiency may squash our need to experiment and explore. Uh, and when they tell us, no, you can't do that or you should not do that, should is one of my all time uh, uh, key phrases to identify the superimposed conscience. You should not do that. We're left with feeling that we're wrong and bad. And in effect, we reject the real self that is trying to awaken. And we also reject ourselves as unique individual human beings. That is not the intent of our parents or authority figures, but it is the effect. Um, the ego may also see self-development as a rebel or obey choice. So we are on a planet of duality. We see things in yes or no, life or death. Um, if we feel we have to rebel to save our own spiritual life and we're rebelling against the superimposed conscience, we're, we're kind of trapped by because we're only focusing on that superimposed conscience instead of going deeper and finding our real conscience. But the guide says that whenever man rebels against laws and all standards of ethics and morals, he does so because he feels that it is a harsh superimposed conscience. He's not seeing it as the best somebody could come up with to hold a, hold a container for society. He sees it as inherently evil and everything has to go. So that's rebellion. But then if we try to obey it, if we simply spend our entire lives being good girls and good boys, then the result of the decision won't be to our liking because that's a superimposed 
idea, there will be corroding effects. There will be a much deeper rebellion, but there will also be self-pity and putting the blame on life and the world. Something's wrong with life because I'm not enjoying life. Uh, by not developing independent faculties of thinking, discriminating, distinguishing, we become weaker and more dependent. Superimposed conscience becomes even more merciless. It has to protect us. We cling to it because it gives us a dualistic choice. Do what is right or you will be lost. You will go to hell. You will be outcast. The more we obey and conform, the less we are able to develop independent faculties of thinking. This is a vicious circle, which is discussed in Patrick Lecture 50. The idea is that healthy self-respect and self-trust can only come from your real self. Um, I'm gonna let that slide speak for itself. So I wanna move on to lower self can influence the superimposed conscience, which is an odd idea. So there are areas where you are free and you function without clinging to superimposed demand standards or rules. Everybody has a place where they do it their own way and they don't really worry about it. And it works very well. The idea is the superimposed conscience that you cling to is the problem. And it only happens where your personal specific inner problems exist. In other words, our clinging is because there's an issue in us. And that's how our inner problems and the superimposed conscience become an issue. <clears throat> so if I have a superimposed conscience that says, nobody's going to like this, I can take it or leave it. I can still hear the voice, but I don't necessarily, I'm not a slave to it. I don't have to obey it, but I don't have to immediately knee jerk react to it. Uh, for the workshop, I recommended the film, A Beautiful Mind which in February, 2022 was available despite copyright issues. It's available complete on YouTube. And I put the, um, the link to it in some of my notes on the lecture. Uh, and the reason I recommended that movie is it's a wonderful example of a man who was dealing with schizophrenia and the, the the world, the fantasy that he saw looked so real that he couldn't disbelieve it. And it took decades for him to understand, become aware and understand that what he was seeing was not real. And then he had to make a decision about what reality to listen to. The figures that he saw and could talk to or the one he, that was explained to him was real. And he decided to discipline himself with feedback from others over what is real versus what am I imagining? And that later in life, and uh, the man John Nash uh, that the movie is based on won a Nobel Prize for economic work. He was a brilliant man. And late in life, what he would explain is, I, I still hear the voices, I still see them. I've decided not to listen. So people very often ask if I identify these voices as negative or inconsequential or a problem, do they go away? Not necessarily. But then a lot of voices in society don't go away and we don't necessarily listen to them. But it is important to know sometimes that they are there. And if 10% of their ideas are good, we, we wanna be open to that 10%. So my superimposed conscience uh, tells me that society will generally not reward this or that. And I listen and I decide whether I wish to accept the consequences of not going along with society. That there's a cost to going my own way and I just need to be prepared for that. So the voice is useful, but not if I am trying to slavishly obey it or slavishly rebel against it. So again, the lower self creeps in here because where I am trapped by my superimposed conscience, there's a reason I'm trapped. 
So there's something going on there. Uh, the guide suggests in this lecture a very subtle quality of lower self that he terms egocentricity. Now the lower self, he explains, is not only that part of human nature in which faults and character defects lie, it also includes something a little more subtle, a little less definable. The best way it can be described is as being a general climate and emotional outlook of egocentricity. So this is where the work gets hard because it's subtle. Um, the less subtle part is that in this area of your being, you wish to rule supreme and that you have to become aware of this. Now, everybody's got it. It's in the next slide. Everybody's got it. The idea is this. I do wish to be queen of the universe. That's my egocentricity speaking. That's my child-centered wanting to, my way all the time. I can hear this voice. I can feel this urge and I can laugh at it. And the more I laugh at it and tease about it, the less insistent it becomes. And the more I can develop the voice that says, we understand that you would like your way all the time. However, either it's not possible or it's not healthy. So the joke version is that we don't want a world full of clones of me, it would be a disaster. So that, that's how preposterous this idea is, that I rule supreme and everything be done my way. So many things would be done wrong or not done at all. Um, and yet, in our wishes and aims, half conscious, half unconscious, we react from this lower self in the way that we do not know or care about another person's interests. And you can catch yourself on that, where you just, you realize you've never asked what the other person wants in a particular given situation. The reason this is subtle is you may have asked in many, many others, but somehow you managed to avoid this area because this area you wanted to do it your way and you didn't want to hear their way because then you'd have to consider it. If nothing else, out of politeness, superimposed conscience, we must be polite. Uh, another way you can tell this is a little piece of your vanity, little wish or gratification of vanity becomes more important than an issue that is important for other people, using the word important twice in one sentence. But the idea is I can push something just because I, it's my vanity that wants the attention or the credit. And I'm actually hurting other people in a way. Well, the question is, what, what is the, what, why is my gratification more important than their contribution and their need? And that's a way you can find very subtle aspects of eccentricity. I will have to admit, I find this all the time in my life. Like the voices, you don't have to do anything about it. You don't have to listen to the voice of eccentricity, but if you don't hear it, you can't counter it. And then if it keeps speaking, you can just hear that as, yes, I might like to do it my way. Let's still be asking what other people want to do. Um, with apologies, I just, oop. there we go. Something happened to my screen. Um, so uh, regardless of our good intentions, this inner world of egocentricity exists. And the more it's hidden, the less it can grow out of its one-sidedness. Uh, so that's the presentation on Patrick Lecture 116. Um, my hope is that you will, let me see if I can stop the share screen. Whoop. There we go. Um, my hope is that you will at some point go back to the lecture and read it. Uh, I have study guides on it. Uh, the slides from this presentation are also on my website. Um, if not this lecture, then perhaps another one appeals to you. 
So thank you for taking the time to listen to this because if you do, you're doing it because you want to be a better human being. You want to expand yourself, transform, develop yourself. And that's the goal, however you manage to do it. Uh, so appreciate your time and attention. Thanks.